you know, you always want to be under the net. The ball will fall your way at some point. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great privilege to speak with Jonathan Siegel, FAIA, a pioneering architect who has reimagined the traditional role of the architect by shooing clients and personally overseeing his own development projects, construction and design. Since 1988, Jonathan has been instrumental in transforming the skylines of downtown San Diego and La Jolla with his acclaimed residential and mixed use projects. He's renowned for his fervent dedication to preserving historic architecture while seamlessly integrating innovative new developments. Jonathan has amassed over 100 design awards. These include seven National AIA Housing Honors and six State of California AIA Urban Housing Awards. In 2003, he achieved the distinction of being the youngest architect in San Diego to be inducted into the AIA's College of Fellows. Jonathan's impact reaches far beyond his architectural ventures. He's a frequent speaker at the AIA chapters and universities globally, advocating the architect as developer philosophy. As co-founder of the Woodbury Institute of Architects Masters in Real Estate Development Program, his contributions to the field are both significant and enduring. He's also launched his comprehensive architect as developer course, which takes architects through the step-by-step process to becoming developers of their own projects, as you can see on his website. In addition to his architectural prowess, Jonathan is an avid collector of mid-50s classic Italian sports cars, with his collection earning numerous prestigious accolades, including Best in Show at Pebble Beach and Hampton Court. And we have a little glimpse of some of those cars as we're speaking with Jonathan in this interview. So, In this episode, Jonathan and I discuss his own career, how he got started in development and where he recommends architects would start today. We speak about why Jonathan believes it's actually riskier to be an architect than it is to be a developer. And we look at where architects often get stuck and where and how to avoid those obstacles. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Jonathan Siegel. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Jonathan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing well. Sunny San Diego. Fantastic. Pleasure to be speaking with you. We've got a fantastic view here of your uh, recently restored Maseratis in, and Alfa Romeos in the background. Looking very... This is part of your private collection? Yes, I have uh, 14 cars now. Lean away, you can see the uh the tz1 alpha the 200 si Zaga, and then and then the a6 gcs zagato there's a career gt in the back 300 sl um this is sort of what i do for entertainment is uh restore cars and then show them worldwide um so it's been a, a wonderful path and uh it's all derived from um, us doing architect as developers the t-shirt says Respect the architect. Um, Amazing. And it's afforded us this, this luxury. Amazing. So you're really inspirational uh, figure in the architecture industry. Number one, you're an architect, you're a fellow of the AIA, and you have really successfully straddled this interesting domain of being both developer and architect. Um, in San Diego, you've, you've created how many? Maybe 300 units or so or more? Oh, 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 probably closer to a thousand. We've done basically wow. one building a year. Sometimes we had a few more, sometimes a few less, but uh, I think we've done over 40, 40 buildings in, in specifically downtown proper of San Diego. And the, the, and the, the quality of some of the 
buildings that you've been produced just make your eyes water. It's absolutely amazing. And it's the kind of sort of stuff that architects would love to be doing, love to have their developer clients be able to, to commission them. How did you start to make this move? What was the what was the kind of journey that you went through to get yourself into the position of being your own client? Well, thank you. That was kind of you to say. Um, there are two things we were talking about. You talked about the buildings and then the, the, how the, the whole part started. So we, um, I grew up in, in, in Los Angeles in Manhattan Beach, went to school in Idaho. I had a track scholarship that got me there. I met my wife. We came down to San Diego and uh, we uh, immediately had you know no money, so we had to get jobs. I worked for two architects for two years each, learned the trade and how to basically produce drawings. I mean, the most important thing. Um, was not to um, enhance my design abilities, but to learn how to create a drawing that then you could give to someone that someone could build. Um, I was on a board in downtown San Diego of residence because there was hardly anybody here. And um, I went to one of the developers. I said, I'd like to show you my portfolio of what I've done. I was working with my second firm. And, and he says, um, you don't be stupid. Don't be an architect. Um, build your own stuff. Be your own developer. <laughs> And then it just started like that. And it was actually a very demeaning, condescending um, talk he had with me. That was Charles Tyson way right. back in 87. And uh, it all just blossomed from there. Amazing. One of the things that often stops architects from kind of treading this path of becoming developer is obviously risk and, you know, access to capital. What was your path? What were the kind of things that the hurdles that you had to overcome to be able to start doing your, your own projects? Well, the, the advice I give to most people is don't lose your day job. You know, stay with your day job and work two jobs. Start doing your own first project, Moonlight, um, until you get it all stabilized and, and permitted and approved, and then you can break out. But don't break out and then go and look for something. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I started. Um, got everything lined up. I met some people in the elevator in a high rise that I was working in uh, with one of the firms and I talked about what I was doing mm -hmm. and uh, they were actually friends with Pete Wilson and Pete Wilson was the mayor, then the governor of, of California. Um, and I hustled a half million dollars from these guys and it all sort of started. I built a model though. Models are interesting because you can do these renderings and so forth, but a, a physical model has this kind of, um, quality that's cute and it's real and people can understand it a drawing maybe not so much but when they can actually see how long something is how tall it is how far it goes back where it goes um there's just this cuteness factor that just captivates people mm -hmm. and we build models of every single project we do so what was the Still, what was the first what was the first project that you that you went ahead with and did as your own being the own client my wife and I lived in um, a place called Park Row, which is in downtown San Diego. And across the street was this piece of property, a triangular lot um, that Charles Tyson's mother owned. Um, I paid $50 a foot. It was $350,000 because it was 7,000 feet. And he gave me five months. Five was, must have been his lucky number to do it. And I built seven row houses. So I went back to New York where you are. I did a, a typological study on row housing, to understand proportions, how far off the street, the main right. living level was, um, and um, sold the fact that I'm buying the largest unit myself of the seven. Now we're down to six. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really large interest level. Downtown only had <clears throat> studios ones and some twos, and I was proposing twos and threes. I was proposing family, actually, lifestyle. So when you live downtown, there was nowhere for you to go with, with children. You just moved out. And I was saying, listen, stay downtown, raise your kids there. And uh, gosh, that was way back in the day. That was, you know, 89 when I did that. 90, I started, 91, finished, sold the last unit, and then the recession hit. So timing's been pretty fortunate for me. I've been uh, very fortunate that things have worked out. And, and for that early project, were you the one that was responsible for actually making the, the sales? Were you working with brokers? Was it, did you hold on to the projects or did you, you, sold, all the, you sold all the units and then you used the capital to the, for the next development? Yeah. Was, that was the C word, condo. That's a bad word. Um, I sold those units and I sold, I sold them myself. Um, 
And I put that as a, as a, as a fee generator for me. It wasn't right. large, it was substantially reduced. Um, partners want to squeeze you as hard as they can or investors, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today I'm a different guy if I did that, which I won't because it's, it's for sale housing. Um, I would, I would say that I'm worth market or more um, than I was worth sub market, but uh, it made the deal happen. And it's all about the big picture. It's not about the parts, it's a little bit of big, pretty parts are not important. It's the global um, element you're trying to achieve and the goal, mm -hmm. the, the goal, you know, the goal is to get to the finish line. How you get there isn't as important as actually getting to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So after you had sold that project, you hit a, hit a recession. Um, what was the pathway from, from there to, to where you are now? So let's see, in, in 87, I would have been 26 years old, started sort of, and then about 28 or 29, I did my first project, made a half a million dollars in one year. And then I did the second project, which was 18 units in Little Italy, and I made $38,000 over two years. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty horrible recession. I was building stuff that was less expensive, better product. Um, so what you what what it eventually evolved to is these these ups and downs that you you know you take. You can't do that unless you have a big piggy bank, and I didn't have a piggy bank. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to um, I wanted to build stuff that actually was. I hate the word sustainable, but let's use the word sustainable as far as like a business practice. And by sure. building apartments and holding on to the apartments and getting rental income, you have this ability to um, have constant income because um, we don't have clients. We never really have had clients. Um, so there's no fee income coming from the clients. So, so whilst you were going through that recession period, you didn't do regular architecture work, get a client, have generate service fees for selling a service you just carried on with the development work and just kind of squeezed a bit of money out of it realized actually the the for sale model is pretty risky and that rental holding onto the buildings actually is, is better long term yeah the for sale the for sale product at the right time works um the mm -hmm. problem with california is we started this sort of um defect litigation dream and uh, you're almost guaranteed getting sued within 10 years the developers and the contractors can just dissolve their companies and move on the architect has this 10 years of strict liability that that, that goes with them it's just unfair that's a, that's another discussion but so that's why that's the discussion why you shouldn't do that um, mm -hmm. it's important to note that uh, we were very fortunate and we built three condo buildings and did not get sued on any of them. Um, when I sold my first large portfolio uh, for $45 million back in 2000, it's crazy. I paid $2.8 million for an insurance policy on the, the buildings that were getting converted by other people to condos, not me, other people, I sold them. And I got four and a half million dollars worth of insurance. Do that. Wait, so, so you so you've got a you're oh. paying insurance on other people doing work on buildings that you originally yeah, designed. Yeah, converted. So it's the conversion that typically has the liability, but it goes back to the architect, me, the contractor. Mm -hmm. He's gone. He's out of business. Um, anyway, so that's something you want to avoid. You want to keep these buildings for at least ten years, and the statute of limitations is gone. And then right, um, so you got that runoff. Yeah, your only liability would be is for disclosure. And um, when you sell something, over disclose, don't under disclose. I had a five unit project that I basically disclosed to a nasty person that went to jail, Gina Champion. Look her up. She uh, was the largest Ponzi scheme, largest female Ponzi scheme in the history of the nation, and the largest Ponzi scheme in San Diego. And we're famous for them. Anyway, I basically <laughs> said to the person, Gina, when she was buying it, Assume that nothing in this project, this five unit project that I renovated is permitted. Mm -hmm. Assume that no permits exist for anything I've done. That's how badly I wanted to just divorce myself from any you know, responsibility. It's just unfortunate. And uh, wow, it worked. She went to jail and I sold my building. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, <laughs> 
So interestingly, then you've, you've you've been through this kind of cycle a few times. Then when you've sold large chunks of your your portfolio, so in two thousand you sold that was the the, right. the, big, the first major um, sell that you did, and then last year you sold your portfolio for what was it eighty five million? Yeah, we sold one two thousand. I think it was two thousand six or seven, just before that recession happened. Right, um, and then we just sold um, last year eighty five million dollars, three buildings. Um, just before all the cap rates made these massive moves. And um, mm-hmm. as we were talking about before, I probably would have lost 25% of my um, net worth if I had not sold those buildings back then. Um, I think it's more than 25%, but uh, mm-hmm. the cap rates moved and, and the return isn't there. Therefore, the values go down. People aren't going to be able to finance out of their projects they're building now. It's going to be pretty ugly pretty soon. So perhaps we could talk a little bit about that, about about cap rate, about interest rates, and the risks that that actually poses to being a developer and being an investor into property. And then we can look at actually why you think that doing what you do is actually less risky than being an architect. Okay. So the most important thing to do is take baby steps. You know, you don't want to make big leaps and you don't want to come out of the gate and go crazy. So if you're going to do what I do, start by doing your own house. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the safest thing you can do because you're going to live there. And the most important part of this concept is you want to be in a position where you don't have to sell something. Um, So your house, you don't have to sell, you move into. If it doesn't sell, um, you're you're living there. Um, Mm -hmm. You furnish the house so it's beautiful. Um, you know, my architecture without furniture in it is a different architecture. The, the, it's all one cohesive part, the furnishings, the interior design, and the architecture. So I typically have moved into the five houses that I built, furnished them, sold them. And most often I've sold them actually with the furniture in them. Um, so you, you need to hopefully make some money and squirrel away the money. You don't go buy a bunch of ski doos and, you know, motorcycles and go like the contractors do and go to the desert, you got to put money away. And the way to really put money away is to build these apartments and the apartments then generate um, income for you uh, <clears throat> on a constant basis. And there's something called depreciation and the depreciation basically offsets the income. So that you have like a net, a net zero as far as your income on paper as the government recognizes it. Uh, and that was my, my, my program. Um, basically since 2000, um, when I decided I didn't want to do condos anymore and get sued. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's worked out quite well. Have you ever, ever, so do you still partner with investors and use like institution or use institutional finance or is it all your own money and you only kind of do one project at a time and then you refinance and pull money out of the, the appreciation of a, of a project? How do you raise capital these days if you need to? Well, let me let me conceptually tell you how we um, paid out capital to partners. So I had something called a put call relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the ability to get rid of the partners at any time I wanted, um, but also have to keep them in in the event that I couldn't get my money out. So I could put to them that I'm going to buy them out and they could call to me that I need to pay them out or we're going to be full investors. So I paid them. This is back in 2000, five points and 15% interest. Crazy, huh? Wow. And, and they got um, a certain percent ownership, which was predetermined on um, saying, here's what I'm going to guarantee that the cost of the project is going to be this. We're going to agree that the actual value is this. There's going to be a sales price that. And then here at the bottom is going to be, let's call it the margin, because I don't like the word profit, the margins left over. And I gave mm-hmm. them five points. 15% interest and then an ownership in the margin here. So what I did was I got the buildings done. And then when they were done, the value had, um, the, the cap rates had come down. Mm-hmm. Um, the cost of money had gone down. So I was able to borrow more. The buildings were more valuable. And I was, a bill, I was able to pay the partners off um, their five points and 15% with the money I got out of the deal. And then I had a year that I had to buy them out of their ownership. 
all their interest was gone. That that was gone. The points were gone. Their ownership yeah. still existed for a year. But in my agreement, I said, I get all the rent for the first year. Right. So I got all the rent. They got nothing. So you could use that. Then, then I took all that rent, put it in a piggy bank, and I took all those deposits, put them in a piggy bank, and after the year, paid them out. They were gone. Great. So then that must have been 2004 that I sold um, all those because uh, I then had 165 units that I think I sold to condo converters. That right. was for $45 million. But think about this. If the traditional split is half and half or worse, 20% to the, the, the developer and 80% to the owner, of that 45 million, let's say that um, I made $20 million profit on that, it would have taken $10 million at a minimum. Oh, no. And to do, you know, 16 million, it would have been painful. And the of the 85 that I just sold, I mean, I can't imagine how the pain would be if I had to pay my investors, which I don't have mm -hmm. half of that. So after that deal, I no longer had general contractors. This is 2000. And after that deal, I no longer had investors. We used our own capital. We used our Johnny Bucks and, and my architect as developer online course um, explains how you basically take that as free capital. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it it just sort of blossomed and went and blossomed and went. And then uh, we checked out. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. And tell us a little bit about when you when you are working with investors on those projects. Obviously, there's kind of complications there with having to to buy them out at the at the end and take the ownership of the of the project. Do they have an influence on the architecture itself? And 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 how do you manage it with with your projects, maintaining such a high level of design and still managing it to be profitable? And do the two ever come into conflict? So I'm, I'm just trying to think back. I don't think any of the investors ever steered me the direction that they wanted to see something. I typically came to them with product that was done and they just wanted to make money. That right. was the bottom line. And I had a track record of, of doing well, getting awards, um, you know, national level AIA honor awards and other residential architecture magazine awards. So the credibility was there and the performance was there. You can look back and it's very simple. Did this project come out nicely and did this project make money? And the answer was yes to both. Therefore, they pretty much left me alone. Um, I just can't imagine what it's like. Um, and I'll give you an, a, an example in a moment, a, a fantastic friend, probably what I consider one of the top, if not the top architect in our city, just told me that he was working on a project and he's also an architect as developer. Um, and that, um, you know, he finished doing some level of design. I don't know. He was owed a couple hundred thousand dollars after the first 75 grand that he got <clears throat> from the owners. And they decided to, you know, no longer want his drawings. I don't know if they didn't like it or the market change, which it did. And he screwed. So he's owed $200,000. And now he has to go sue the client for all yeah, the work that he did. It's just like, this is bullshit. I mean, you do the work and you get paid for it. Um, well, he did the work and they don't want to pay him. So then he's got to go sue him. So uh, it's just a bad way to be, you know, and, and I'm sure there's many other stories about fantastic clients that took care of them. They're, they're architects. I just have other architects that just whine a lot about, the fact they don't like to work for clients yeah. and they want to do the wrong thing. And these are fantastic, talented people, very successful. You would know all the names um, and they just continue on. Yeah, it's, it's the most desired goal that I hear from architects is for them to be client free and for doing their own work. And I can only think, I mean, it's, it's rare though. It's, um, it's, it's rare that architects actually end up doing it for whatever reasons. There's, there's obstacles in the way. A lot of it's to do with capital and a lot of it's to do with the attitude towards taking risk or the perceived it should, risk. It, it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. 
The biggest thing I see that people make mistakes on across the board in business is they never have written agreements. I just was talking to someone about um, a couple that are doing a restaurant because they want to do their own work. They're both designers and they had a chef that um, they had some kind of verbal agreement or some kind of email and they didn't button down the agreement. Now the chef's saying, you know, you said this and they said, no, we said that and it's blowing up their deal. You've got to get the stuff in writing. Everybody mm -hmm. really appreciates that. And when you do it in writing, the vetting happens. People see things. Um, again, if you're doing uh, a development deal and you have investors, you need to over disclose. Back to my architect as developer um, online course that I give. I give all that stuff. I, how to get a deal, how to get investors, how to get a bank loan, how to write this, the agreements, indemnities, contracts for subcontractors. They're super important. And maybe that's the part that your um, people you're talking about, the architects are concerned about or, or fearful because they don't have the, the roadmap, right? They went to school to be an architect. They, they worked in an office, learned how to draw. Um, and this is, I gotta tell you, it's pretty simple stuff. If mm -hmm. you follow the language and the patterns and the procedure, um, Obviously, you know, if you have a problem, you have a problem, you know, you got to work that out. But uh, it's, in my opinion, way easier to do what I do than a general architect. I love it. Way easier. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm working, I'm working on my house. This is one, one of my two goals actually was to build a high rise that I don't know. I'm, sure, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. It's on a 50 by 100 lot. Uh, we have a lot. Uh, we have the drawings and the economies, as, as you know, as everybody knows, you know, the cap rates have changed. The interest rates change. Rents are down. Um, but my house, for some reason, is is like where all the hot spots are on the ocean in La Jolla. Um, we're taking down an existing residence and we're putting up a new house for us out of concrete. And, uh, you know, it's just I was just marveling. The other night when I was sitting there smoking a cigar, I'm not drinking for 90 days, so I wasn't having a drink um, about how cool it is that I'm just doing something that no one's giving me feedback on. Mm -hmm. No one's, I don't have to do a whole set of drawings to present to somebody to waste a bunch of time to then get feedback in two weeks than to go on a lull, than to have to have other work. I mean, I'm moving forward at, at the speed of light. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting contractors in line. Uh, we're seeing the prices start to come down on certain elements. Um, it's just, it's a, a magical way to do stuff. It, it really is the drawings. We do less drawings. Uh, we have no specifications. Those are in mm -hmm. the contract. Um, I just very, I feel very, very fortunate that um, I found this way. Uh, no arguments in, in, in contract administration and. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's the death warrant right there. Right. Yeah. Where the architect um, doesn't have the, the funds because there's no allocation of funds to manage the work mm -hmm. through on the construction. And if you think about it conceptually, the architect has been paid an amount of money to produce a set of drawings. The client is naive, the architect most likely also. They think that that is, you know, like you, you buy a, a model to put a little toy car together and there's drawings and there's the parts um, and you put the model together. That's not how a set of drawings works in architecture and there's things that influence, but the client thinks they've already paid for that and they don't wanna pay the architect to come out on site during the course of construction and make sure one, the contractor is following the drawings, which they don't, and mm -hmm. two, sure that any things that are done incorrectly um, are resolved. Um, so I do the drawings. Matthew, my son, does the drawings. <clears throat> Typically other people that work for us. <clears throat> if you draw it, you build it. And we're out there every day. So I am the architect, the superintendent, the ditch guy. If you would need me, I'll, I'll put waterproofing down. I'll throw trash away. I'll sweep up. Um, you, you'd be surprised doing the sweep up, what you find on the project, errors, parts missing, waste, what have you. Um, and, and there's just an efficiency there that doesn't exist with the, with the triangle. The triangle is the owner, the contractor, and the architect 
I have a circle and I'm right in the middle. I'm, you know, I'm never fighting anybody. I'm just bouncing off the rim all back to the hole again, all back to the hole again. So it's like a basketball winning every time versus mm -hmm. this thing here where the owner's like, hey, architect, contractor says your drawing suck. And the architect says, hey, owner, the contractor sucks. And then the contractor says, hey, architect, you suck. So it's like nobody, everybody's pulling and no yeah. one's coming together. It's problematic. It's something you just, it's just something that's going to be. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. It? There's so much kind of inherent friction in the traditional architectural model. Yep. And the architect yep. is trying to maintain some kind of, you know, professional independence. And it's inevitable that allegiances kind of develop and the architect is often the, the point of a lot of blame. And this is where we start to see the, the architectural service just kind of either expand and the architect's not got a mechanism for being able to keep control of it or get paid for half of it. Not to mention the stress that yeah. kind of goes along with it. It's, it's, it's difficult. Very, 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 very difficult. In your team, what, who, who and what do you have kind of like as your core team around you? Do you have a full like architectural office? That's doing well, I've had, I've had an architectural office that was probably as large as maybe eight plus accountant, bookkeeper, you know, plus my wife helped um, mm -hmm. property management because we do, you know, the development, the architecture, the construction. Now we don't have a general contractor. Have right. System. Okay. Sometimes we manage a group of employees that are actually framing and building. That was in 2004. Now it's coming back again. Um, and then we obviously do the architecture uh, and we do the property management. So we're full spectrum. Um, do you do the sales so, and the lettings? Say that again. Do you do the sales and the lettings as well? Like finding we the tenants? We do the lettings, as you call them. Yeah, the rentals. The um, rentals, that's the worst yeah. Job, we're a horse job in the world. Uh, we manage, we have two. So right now we have a, a, an architectural firm, a development company, and then we have the property management company. Property management company, Matthew, orchestrates most of that uh, with Gael, who rents our units. Mm -hmm. um, and she's part-time. And then we have two full-time guys, um, Super Mario and Luis, and they fix things, toilets, things fall off the wall, painting units, turning units over, cleaning the properties. Um, then on the architectural part, it's basically me and Matthew that do that. I've got, I've got a Johnny stick. I point. Let's see if I can here. There you go. Whoa, there I go. I, I pointed stuff, and he changes them um, on the on the computer. And then we have two other ladies um, that are that are part time working with us. Um, but the, you know, I the unfortunate thing is I can't do the AutoCAD stuff. If I could, then I'd be you know wizard. Um, I'm mm -hmm. just a little too past that. It's past my pay grade. Um, so it's me and Matthew. And so I do, um, typically I do freehand details of mm -hmm. um, every, and then those are eight and a half by 11. Um, they get keyed into the drawings and it's all freehand, everything. Um, now they've, they've taken some of those drawings and, and made them into the, um, you know, the CAD drawings, but I've got no problem doing that. Now let's talk about efficiency for a second. So I'm on site and just outside here, we're building another 11 units. And the subcontractors are out there. There's no job shack with a computer and, a, you know, a gumball machine and a popcorn machine. And you know, the contractors typically have, um, you walk out, what are you doing? I'm doing this. Do you got a problem? Come on in. So it's the, the efficiencies here. What do I do here? You do this. There's no job directive. There's no RFI. There's no change order. There's no system that delays, um, which is traditional in the architectural world. Mm -hmm. We like do it. I'll go and, and I, the subcontractors appreciate that we have an efficiency and timing to build something and we have typically an efficiency in the cost of things and um, most importantly we're not trying to build the Salk Institute we're not trying to fine-tune something to the millionth degree in the crisp edge yeah nastier and gnarlier the finishes are in the concrete the better and then we put mm -hmm. a piece of wood next to it. So the contrast is beautiful. We've learned where to save money. We've learned where to spend money. So you actually developed your own kind of architectural language that has its own efficiency and aesthetics into it. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. We, we, we've developed um, 
an efficiency of concrete and we developed mm -hmm. an efficiency of interior finishes. Um, I'm trying to think of something. We're working on the window systems. We didn't do a great job on the waterproofing of the, uh, the sliding glass windows uh, underneath it. It was in this incubator stage. We were trying to make it go away and just see the concrete go over. But I think we've got that, that buttoned up now. We'll have to on this house, on the water. Um, and it's pretty gnarly on the ocean. I mean, it's, the salt is corrosive. So we're yeah, trying to build harsh. no metal whatsoever, mm -hmm. basically concrete and glass. Um, and what about, yeah. what, what about actually finding the land then? I, I was I'm, interesting. I was chatting to a, a developer here in New York or someone who works in project management for a lot of developers. And he was giving me some pretty interesting insight into the work that developers will do in terms of site assemblage. So, you know, actually buying plots of land and perhaps they'll create a different, different, a different organization or a different company or an LLC to buy each separate plot of land so that they can be discreet about it. And then you've got all the kind of negotiations that goes with air rights. And there's a huge amount of work that goes into actually finding, right. developing right. a plot of land. What, what is it like where you are in San Diego? Is it as, is it as fiercely competitive and you've got to really keep your ear to the, to the ground to know where land gets, gets released? How does that work? I would say that a third of our projects have been, there's a sign, let's go after that piece of property. A third right. have been word of mouth and a third have been brokers. And the brokers are, are, are sharp. I mean, they're aggressive. They know who's building what. They know most of them do. Um, <clears throat> they know the size of the projects you're working on, um, you know, no broker is coming to me for a full block downtown to build a 35 story high rise. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a big national developer they're going for. Um, so they sort of target you on that. Um, back to advice I'm trying to give, uh, <clears throat> if you're going to do work, I would suggest that you do work, um, in your own area. I mean, where you live. So for instance, the people you were talking about, if you said, Hey, Jonathan, come to New York and do a project. I'd be such a fish out of water and I'd eat it. I'd eat it badly. So <clears throat> those people understand that they understand how to do that from a stealth standpoint to assemble all those parcels. Um, that mm -hmm. takes a long time and a lot of money. Um, and we're not interested. I had one project that we moved this beautiful historic um, 1930s uh, Ford dealership. I mean, it was small, it was 800 square feet on the property <clears throat> and then built a building around it. And we opened escrow, closed escrow four months later and we had our building permits and we built the building in 12 months. So that wow. was 16 months from opening escrow to completing it. Now that doesn't always happen. This house has been a complete nightmare. Um, thank you, city of San Diego, incompetent beyond belief um, planning department, unbelievably incompetent planning department. May I say that? Yeah, absolutely. You wouldn't be the first. Uh, and um, what was my point here? That's three years. I'll be almost almost three years in the process of getting this approved. It's just a complete joke. I'll, <clears throat> I've done an environmental impact report because it's a an old house, not historic in my opinion, just old, 1923, not, not well mm -hmm. done. And <clears throat> that cost me $100,000 for that report, which is basically documenting the approval process, a joke. I have over $100,000 in city of San Diego hourly um, billing that they've done for the planning. I don't have a building permit. I'm talking about planning. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're 30 days away from getting a building permit. So you can concurrently do these things. The planning on um, the city of San Diego has been remiss on filling a bunch of their um, appointed positions, planning departments, city council, all these other parts and bits that the mayor is supposed to fill. I think they were remiss on like 25% openings that are now that they haven't filled. And so we went this Thursday, we're supposed to go and get our final HRB historic resources board approval. Right. And then we go to planning commission next week and, oh, we can't, go this week, we got to get kicked back to the 8th of next month because they don't have a quorum because they don't have enough people on the committee. Uh, it's just the absurdity 
and insanity of this. Um, just let us build. Mm -hmm. Get out of our way. And then, you know, the respect the architect thing came from in Berlin when we were walking around there. Someone had stenciled, respect the architect. Watch us as we build your cities. Pretty cool. And that's right. I, I, nothing's new. Everything's stolen from somewhere else. And so is this. <laughs> anyway. Love it. I love it. So, so actually during the planning process, is that uh, quite a, a risky part of the build for you? Because there's so much of it out of your control in the, in the sense that yeah. you're working with a non-commercial entity who doesn't necessarily care how fast yeah. things get done. Another word of advice um, that I haven't taken myself because I wanted to build this house in the water. Just whatever you do, be stealth like your people. Stay under the radar. Get a project that doesn't need any community involvement or any mm -hmm. building department involvement except for getting a permit and go build a building. Um, now's the time actually to start teeing up for the next wave of development. Um, get your stuff together. Get a piece of dirt. People are going to be willing to take a hit on the property um, cost and people are going to be willing to give you time because there's nobody excuse me, out there right now doing this stuff. So mm -hmm. um, if people want to do their own work, let's say build four units or eight units or what have you, or build their own house. The housing thing may be different. I'm not, I'm not really up on how housing is, is in the nation. I know here it's horrible. Uh, it's still uh, supply demand over, over demand, limited supply. Um, and that will change. I was, I was telling Matthew, who's upstairs, uh, you're going to see something dramatic happen and it will happen instantly. It's not going to be the slow slowing of the economy. Something's going to happen. Like a pop. Um, that's a pop. There's some kind of pop. I don't know what it is. I'm not saying it's a terrorism pop, but there's going to be some kind sure. of pop. And then it's going to be, holy shit, really? Our deficit really is a problem? Mm-hmm rates just rip through the ceiling or rates drop or whatever they're going to do something i believe will dramatically happen so squirrel away some money have some money in a piggy bank <clears throat> the opportunities or just survival mm -hmm. um, i have a certain level of of dollars I'm trying to make it even here um that i've always through my my uh, my career i've said i have to have this much money in the bank to make myself feel comfortable um that I didn't lose everything. I mean, you need to have the ability to weather probably a couple of years mm -hmm. of no income whatsoever in, um, in my world. Yeah. Um, and I've always had one year, five year and 10 year goals, personal, um, architecturally, um, and you know, other car wise, um, goals are to, um, to win this or win that. And when our cars mm -hmm. go all over the world, um, you know, we've won runner-up at Best in Show in Pebble. We won Best in Show at Hampton Court. These are things that I didn't actually think were going to happen, even though <laughs> in my goal was make this happen. I thought it was a different card at a different time, and things serendipitously happen, which is my wife, my life. I could say one word: it's serendipity. Things just happen. Um, you know, you always want to be under the under the net. The ball will fall your way at some point. So, so we're entering into a kind of a very uncertain world at the moment. And obviously, you know, interest rates are, are kind of starting to, to creep up. And there's been a lot of fear, if you like. A lot of architects are starting to see markets slow down with their own developer clients. There's a lot of hesitation with high net worth individuals about building stuff. Is, what, what is your kind of thoughts on doing development at this time? Is it worth waiting for whatever it is, this pop to happen, or, or is there opportunity on the horizon of this? There, there, there's always opportunity. There's always going to be something you can do, no matter what, during whatever cycle it is. Um, I remember the cycle when people were going and buying lots downtown because they were getting a better return on parking a car on a piece of property downtown than they were to de do development. Um, so, <laughs> For instance, I was on, on phase one of this building. So I built, I built this, this is uh, this vault here is uh, a, a Butler building, um, Quonset hut that's made of 6,000 nuts and bolts and um, 
thousands of pieces of 10 foot by two foot sheets of sheet mm -hmm. metal that are all together. So that one, I had a construction loan and this is when um, the race just started moving. And I was paying an eight and a half percent construction money. And I'm like, this is a joke. I'm only getting four or five in the bank. Um, and I just sold my portfolio, so I'm paying cash. So I paid off the construction loan. Now I'm going forward and doing my next phase, which is the last part. I moved to historic house here. Um, and I built 17 apartments plus the three historic, and I've got another 11, and then I've got my garage here. Um, so I'm getting an eight and a half percent return on my money building this stuff cash. Um, that's good, really good. And then I have offsetting depreciation. Um, so if you build it now, then at some point, um, the rates will settle to what I mm -hmm. don't know. Say, let's say six and a half or seven percent on five year, 10 year money, and five years, maybe six, six and a half. You know, I need them to be closer to five for me to do some takeout money. Um, so I'll wait, but I'm still getting eight and a half percent of my money. And now I just bid two months ago the framing of these 11 apartments. They're all one bedrooms, and the bid was 340. 40 grand lumber just came down 20%. I just got that bid. Same guy revises bid because of the lumber 280. There's a $60,000 drop. That stuff is going to happen across the board. Right. You're going to see people become a little bit more aggressive. You know, the door guy is going to have some more doors in, you know, in his back room now versus, you know, you're on order. Um, it will all change. And now's the time to get going on this stuff. Get it teed up so mm -hmm. you can do it moment's notice amazing it's not, not time to build a high rise though unfortunately because that's what i want to do <laughs> very cool mm -hmm. um i think that's a, a good place for us to conclude the conversation then is uh, really really fascinating insights and really inspiring to hear what it is that you've done and what you've what you've created over the last uh 20 plus years or so and definitely live in the, the architect's dream. So Jonathan, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Very much appreciate it. Wonderful, thank you for inviting me. It's been a wonderful talking to you. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.